Hello and thanks for tuning in to the, the third lecture of the year. Um, having looked at the skeletal system in our previous two lectures, we move on now to the muscular system. The objectives are, are pretty clear and, and hopefully pretty easy for us to achieve. To distinguish between the, the different types of muscle, outline the general, general characteristics that are common to muscle tissue, describe the structure of skeletal muscle, define what the origin and insertion of a muscle is and identify these for a selection of muscles and use anatomical terminology to describe the location of bones and muscles. So let's get straight into it. The types of muscle, well there's three types of muscle, we've got skeletal muscle, cardiac muscle and smooth muscle. Now primarily in this subject we're really worried about skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is, is the muscle that moves the skeleton, it's the muscle that's used in physical activity. Uh, it's it's highlighted by its, or it's known for its, what's called a striated appearance, this alternation between light and dark bands when you view it under a microscope. And it is voluntarily controlled skeletal muscle. So you make the decision as to whether to move it or not, and that's essentially what voluntary control means. It also is muscle that's attached to the skeleton via tendons. All right, so our tendons are, are, are those structures we've already learned about when we talked about joints in the last lecture that attach our muscles to bones. Our next type of muscle is cardiac muscle. This is a muscle that's found in the heart. It's also striated like our skeletal muscle, but unlike our um, skeletal muscle, it is involuntary. That means we don't have to think about using it. It, it happens automatically, which uh, as you can imagine is a good thing. Otherwise sleeping would be really, really difficult if you had to wake up every second or so to make sure your heart was beating. Uh, smooth muscle is also involuntary, but it's it's also not striated. All right? So it's the, the type of muscle that lines the insole inside of, of vessels like the blood vessels or the hollow organs such as the intestines. And it actually assists uh, in a wave sort of motion in helping substances through those organs or through those vessels. So there's sort of a, a way, a rolling wave of, of muscle contraction in the walls of the arteries, which helps to push the blood along the vascular tissue. The same in the intestines as, as it's pushed through your body and digestive system. So when we look at our, our types of muscle and we look mainly at the skeletal muscle here, it's got four main functions. The first is uh, Movement occurs through the interaction of bone, skeletal muscle and the joints. When the skeletal muscles contract, they exert forces on the tendons which then pull the bones, pull on the bones causing joint movement. Muscles also give substances within the body. All right, so smooth muscle helps to move, sorry, move substances within the body. So smooth muscle helps to move food through the digestive system. The cardiac muscle moves blood through the body. And also the smooth muscle helps to move blood through the body as well, uh, the, the muscles of the arteries. When postural muscles contract, they help to stabilize and maintain body positions. Uh, this means that muscles might be contracting even though no movement is present. So you think about when you're standing still, you've got the muscles of your legs obviously in some sort of contraction to actually hold you upright and stop you just falling to the floor. Um, our postural muscles are really considered to be muscles that are simply working against the resistance of gravity. We might consider it to be no movement, but quite simply, if, if there was no muscle tension or muscle contraction, gravity would win and we'd just end up being a... Uh, a pile of, of pile of flesh just lying on the floor. So obviously our muscles are doing something to keep us upright, whether it be sitting, standing, or any position that essentially is working against gravity. Uh, when the muscles contract either voluntarily or involuntarily, they can generate up to 85% of our body heat. And so this is why you know when we get really cold, we actually start to shiver. Now we start to um, contract our muscles even when we don't need to for movement, in, and that's the body's effort to try and create some additional heat to stop us from being freezing cold. Um, the properties of muscle tissue, and the, the three key pro properties are the fact that of contract, contractility, extensibility, and elasticity. So contractility is the ability to shorten and generate a force when stimulated. All right, so normally muscles are arranged in pairs. We think of the biceps as a pair, or as a partnership with the triceps, or the hamstrings as a partnership with the quadriceps, or even the pectorals as a partnership with the muscles here of the upper back. Essentially what happens is as one of these muscles contracts, its partner muscle is going to slowly be stretched or be extended. And this helps to make sure that the, the joint movement is more coordinated and, and less jerky. And we call this concept the concept of reciprocal inhibition. This, this concept where when mus one muscle is contracting on one side of the joint, the muscle on the opposite side of the joint is going to be relaxing and extending. 
The ability of a muscle to be stretched beyond its resting length is this concept of extensibility. So we've got the ability to shorten and create force is contractility. The ability to extend beyond its, its resting length is extensibility. Uh, and that obviously increases the range of motion of a joint. The more, ex more extensibility your muscles have, the greater your range of motion. Uh, and elasticity is the ability of the muscle to return to its original shape or original length once it has been stretched. Uh, and the muscles are, are very, very good at that unlike the ligaments as we learned in our previous lecture. The structure of our muscle is pretty simple. We've got this, this material called fascia, which is essentially will become the tendon when it works its way to the end of the muscle, but it surrounds the entire muscle tissue. And that layer of fascia is called perimysium. We then have our muscle fibers arranged into smaller compartments, and those are going to be surrounded by sorry, perimysium, the epimysium surrounds the entire muscle tissue. So we've got the epimysium surrounding the entire muscle tissue, the perimysium surrounding the smaller compartments, and the individual muscle fibers are surrounded by what's called the endomysium. All right, so hopefully we can remember endomysium as being the most inner layer of fascia, just like the endosteum being the most inner layer of bone tissue. Uh, so that's all the information written down here. Now our muscles are made up of, of thousands of long cylindrical muscle fibers all laying parallel to one another, which we can see here we've just got fiber after fiber after fiber after fiber after fiber, all laying from end to end next to each other all the way through. Within each fiber are going to be dark and light stripes. Um, um, and, and these are made up and these stripes are essentially caused by myofibrils. Um, and the myofibrils make up, uh, are broken up in, further again into these sarcomeres, and these sarcomeres have within them contractile proteins called actin and myosin. It's the actin and myosin which are essential for muscle movement. Now, we don't need to know much about that in this particular unit, we just need to know that they exist, but certainly in one of the units later on in the course, we'll actually get into the nuts and bolts of how the actin and myosin and the sarcomeres all contribute and uh, to, to muscle movement. But at this stage, all we need to know are the three concepts of muscle, the fact that they're contractile, they're extensile, and they're also elastic. I finally got there. All right, so when a muscle is, is trained, muscles will get bigger and experience hypertrophy due to an increase in myofibrils. So it's increase in myofibrils, but not an increase in muscle cells. All right, so our muscle cell is, is not quite the same as an increase in myofibrils. Uh, and obviously when a muscle, not obviously, but when a muscle is not used, if, it, if it's going to get bigger when it's used, when it's not used, it gets smaller. All right, the structure of skeletal muscles continued. So as I said, the fascia will work beyond the muscle and it becomes the, the tendons. Tendons come in a, a, sh a variety of different shapes depending on where they're located within the body. They can be just straight cords that look similar to ropes or they can be broad flat sheets called aponeurosis. All right, groups of tendons maybe in the wrist might be include in, enclosed in uh, connective tissue called tendon sheaths, and these sheaths are going to contain synovial fluid, and we need those sheaths there to then obviously house the synovial fluid and make sure it doesn't keep wasting away into the rest of the body. And this presence of the synovial fluid is going to make sure that those tendons, which are going to be right up against each other, potentially rubbing against each other, are going to move across one another much more easily due to a decrease in friction because of the presence of the synovial fluid. Now, if we've got tendons at either end of the, of the muscle, in most cases, sometimes it's along the length of the muscle, depending on the type of muscle fibre we're dealing with, whether it's a, a few form or a pennate muscle and again later in the year we'll get into what exactly that means but essentially the middle of the muscle where it's just flesh and, and not going to be uh, tendon is called the muscle belly. Um, we continue on here muscles tend to have very very good blood supply and that's not surprising because um, we know that we need to transfer oxygen to those muscles and we transfer oxygen via the blood. So if we didn't have good blood supply, well then we're sort of defeating ourselves before we even get started. We also have really good nerve supply and, and given that our, our muscles are controlled by our brain, that makes sense as well. Remembering our skeletal muscles are voluntary contro voluntarily controlled by our brains and our other muscle types are involuntarily controlled by our brains. Uh, the nerves that bring impulses from the CNS are called motor neurons, all right? So they're specific nerves that uh, take on the task of innovating the muscles, and because of their result in movement, we call them motor neurons. These neurons release neurotransmitters into the blood, which stimulate the muscle 
to contract and produce force. And there is also a rich network of capillaries which provide the muscle with oxygen, nutrients and calcium as well as to remove waste products. And this means that uh, because of this, this huge amount of blood flow that can get there, that the muscles are pretty good at repairing damage to themselves. The more serious the injury though, the, the more we have to maybe engage in rehabilitation activities um, to ensure that any sort of leftover damage is minimized. And we normally call that leftover damage scar tissue. Now, with our muscles, we have origins and insertions. The origin is normally the beginning of the muscle, and we refer to the beginning as being the, the part of the muscle that's closest to the proximal end of the, the bone that it attaches to, uh, and so the, or the, the most proximal part of the muscle, so the closest part of the muscle to the midline of the body. And the insertion is, is the more distal end of the muscle, or the part of the muscle that's further away from the midline of the body. It tends to be that the origin of the muscle is fixed, it stays still. And it's the insertion, or, or where the insertion is attached, that that's usually the, the part that's going to then move when that particular muscle contracts. So if we think of the biceps, the origin is up in the shoulder, up on the clavicle and also on the scapula, but the insertion is down on the radius and ulna. And we know that when we contract our bicep we don't get any shoulder movement but what we do get is we get lower arm movement or movement of the radius and ulna so that hopefully helps to get this idea of the fixed end and the mobile end it tends to be the insertion end of the muscle that's the mobile end and the origin end of the muscle that is the fixed end if you scroll through the rest of this PowerPoint you'll see the origin insertion of, of a, a range of different muscles whether it be the muscles of our trunk whether it be the, the muscles of upper extremity, so the arms, and the muscles of the legs. You'll notice that for a lot of our muscles, we have numerous origins and numerous insertions. And that's not unsurprising or unfamiliar. It helps to increase the stability of the muscle. It also helps to increase the range of motion of the muscle if it does have a variety of origins and insertions. Okay, obviously each origin and each insertion would most likely need its own tendon. So it's not, again, unusual for muscles to have multiple tendons. Um, for example, the biceps is called the biceps, that, that word bi, because it has two tendons, it has two heads. Um, and also the, the triceps, the same reason, it has three. Okay, so hopefully that all makes sense. As always, if there's any issues, let me know. Thank you.